Okay. Um, I make a motion to close the hearing and to uh, submit a permit or to approve the permit. Is that what it is? Yeah. To approve the project as presented. And to approve the project as presented. I second. Do I have a second? Yeah, I second. And uh, everybody in favor? Any more discussion? Any? Aye. Aye. So we okay, so approved. the other thing is just so you know, um, I'll, I can do the roll call for the votes because we're on Zoom. Um, you need to call out and ask how each member uh, votes because okay, so um, there's an audio record as well. Um, right. So Melissa, how would you vote? Um, in favor. And um, Oh my God, um, I just, Emily? In favor. And uh, Pauline? Yes, in favor. And I'm also in favor. And that's all of us that are here, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. So now we can go on to the next hearing, if I'm not mistaken. And so we're gonna open the hearing for the um, demolition review and new construction of St. John Cantus Church by O'Connell Development, 10 Holly Street, um, parcel 32A-171. And um, uh, is someone here who is gonna present the um, uh, project? Uh, before we get started, I would like to recuse myself um, my husband works for Kuhn Riddle Architects, so I'm going to be leaving the meeting now. Okay. Thanks, Emily. We'll see you at the next one. And yes, your representation, the owner, um, Matt Welker. I think you're mute. You might. No, I, I can't. He's, he's not very loud. You, I can't hear you very well. Is this, can you hear me any better now? Waking up, oh, that's better. Try again. Can you hear me? Yes. That's loud, yeah. Okay, so speak loudly is what I understand. Um, so uh, if, if I may, um, thanks for the, uh, the opportunity to present this evening. And um, the purpose of this application is for demolition of the St. John Cantius Church. Um, we understand the importance that the, the church has served the community over the years and completely appreciate uh, historically what is meant to the city and to the former parishioners. Um, our company, um, O'Connell Development Group, is a wholly owned subsidiary of the O'Connell Company. Uh, we've been in Holyoke for the past 140 years. And so we, we absolutely can appreciate, um, you know, the anchors that, that many folks feel um, keep, keep participants or buildings formed to the community. Um, but um, in this case, um, and Charles Roberts from Kuhn Riddle can speak to this um, later on as we present the, the, the type of development that we are proposing in its place. Um, but this is a, a very high level concept, um, only looking to um, seek approval for the demolition, knowing that there will be an opportunity for the Central Board of Assessment for the Committee. And I'm sorry, I missed that. Knowing that, knowing that there's going to be another opportunity for the, uh, the committee to review and comment. Um, and we expect this to be an iterative process where we, we're soliciting comments and feedback from the city as well as the neighbors on style, materials. Um, and so what we're presenting in its place tonight is a uh, is very high level concept. Um, but uh, with that, I uh, would like to uh, present a little bit of our, our background on the, the acquisition of the property, um, provide some logic and understanding of our decision-making process and present essentially our alternative analyses uh, that led us to the decision. Um, this is a decision that we have not taken lightly, um, but unfortunately, um, 
discovering the level of deferred maintenance plus the effects of the pandemic have proven uh, a financial and practical solution um, not available. Um, so in terms of the timeline of our acquisition, we acquired the property back in uh, March of 2020. And uh, you're, going, you're going in and out. Yeah. Your voice is going in you and have, out. You have to stay closer to the microphone. The microphone. Is this any better? Yes. I apologize. Um, so uh, when we purchased the property, one of the constraints that was um, from the beginning uh, was the fact that um, there's a stipulation that no use uh, inconsistent with the chief teachings of the Roman Catholic Church um, would be installed and that restriction would run with the land. And so um, although that didn't take all opportunities off the table, it effectively shrunk the tenant pool from the beginning. And um, it's my understanding that the last church service occurred in January of 2010. And it's been marketed since then and had uh, a fairly broad uh, reach in terms of the, uh, the brokerage community. And in some respects, the fact that uh, until we did acquire the property, there were not any takers speaks to, um, you know, my position, our position would be the, the, uh, the obsolescence of the building. Um, on top of that, uh, once we did acquire the property, uh, because it had sat vacant for so many years, um, we undertook uh, an extensive exterior building valuation and determined through a competitive bidding process that in order to bring the building to weather tight condition, we would be spending uh, approximately $675,000. And that is um, only to bring the shell to a condition where we could protect against the element. So that had um, nothing that included what would, what would be necessary to upgrade mechanicals, to upgrade uh, structural, um, anything with uh, accessibility concerns. And so um, that um, essentially put us in uh, the hole at 675,000. Um, on top of You're that- You're fading again. It essentially put us in- In a hole for 675,000. Um, on top of that, we also undertook a uh, hazardous material and, business and uh, building assessment analysis and determined that um, the environmental remediation cost and abatement would be another $100,000. Um, again, uh, that is without any, any upgrades or to um, provide the building with, with anything that could be, in essence, marketable. Um, and so when we did acquire the property, uh, prior to that, we had a fairly extensive due diligence process and we had been in discussions with a number of restaurateurs, uh, breweries, um, and potential retail operators. Uh, we had undertaken a, a test fit study by Austin Design, um, based in Greenfield, and they are responsible for a number of the fairly high profile breweries in the region. And I'm sorry, you just faded out again. So their Austin design is responsible for a, a number of the high profile breweries in the, in the region. And uh, so the intent once we did acquire the property and leading up to the acquisition was to reuse and repurpose the church building. Um, but as we know, when uh, the pandemic had uh, really started to, to, you know, run its course back in March, April of last year. Um, the entire retail environment, including restaurants, have been um, turned upside down. Um, it's in our experience that the the combination of the the state restrictions uh, limiting occupancy as well as the, you know, the, the long-term effect on consumer behavior has uh, really changed the retail environment with 
almost no visibility to the end. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, many of the retailers, if they're not uh, forced to close, have either pivoted towards um, a takeout delivery model or have uh, shrunk their footprint. Um, and in a lot of ways, uh, as we can see kind of in the existing retail environment in Northampton, uh, there's a lot of difficulty to, to backfill the existing vacancy. Um, one of the other um, uses that we could look at uh, kind of along the same lines, which the, the, back, uh, the, uh, the pandemic has. I'm sorry, you just faded out again. One of the other uses that right, you so looked one at. One of the other uses that has been affected by the pandemic is office. Um, we did evaluate the potential for a co-working space and the same conclusion was reached as, as with retail. The, uh, the environment for office uh, end use is, is one such that employers are looking to either shrink their footprint or work more towards a, a flexibility work from home model. And then the last uh, evaluation that we undertook was a, a retrofit of the, of the church building to accommodate residential use, either condominium, so a for sale product or rental. And by our best guess, we were only able to fit four. And um, based on uh, evaluation on uh, a financial return standpoint, uh, we determined that to break even, we would be looking to charge um, upwards of $4,000 to, to accommodate the cost of construction and uh, the level of retrofit that would be required to make these type of units marketable. And it's just not something that we felt the market could bear or we could um, realistically have any source of funding to construct. And with that, um, would like to turn it over to Charles and he can walk through some of the, uh, the high level concepts on our proposed replacement. We have to unmute Charles. I told myself I wasn't gonna to forget to unmute and lo and behold. Hi, I'm Charles Roberts with Kuhn Riddle Architects. Is, is my voice coming through okay? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, Matt, um, for uh, that, that intro to, the, to, the, to what we're talking about here this evening and um, laying out O'Connell's perspective on this. But I, I just wanted to uh, walk folks through sort of the, uh, the design concepts that we're looking at here this evening, as, as Matt said, it's very, it's very preliminary. I think we're, I, I, I think we're willing, or Connell's willing to commit to the concept you're gonna, you're gonna see tonight, but architecturally it's going to evolve um, through neighborhood engagement and, and working with, uh, working with your board and with, and with uh, the planning department to, to create an architecture that is really um, uh, compatible with the neighborhood and that reinforces the, uh, the, the stronger uh, residential qualities of the neighborhood and the, and the walkability with downtown. Um, so I'm gonna show a couple images. Uh, Carolyn, can you, uh, can I share my screen or do you have to give me yep. permission? No, you're all set to go. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see here. Um, I wanna make sure I get the, Okay, are folks seeing the zoning map? Yes. Okay, so this red circle right here is the is is the uh, where St. John is located. Um, this is Holly Street here, where my mouse is running. Um, Phillips Street, 
runs up this way, and this is this is Bridge Street running here along this red line. Um, the the pink area is the uh, central business zoning district, and then the uh, the yellow area here is the um, is is the I believe is the URC zone. And so this site really exists kind of on, on the cusp of these two worlds. It's it's sort of it's both residential and it's and it's both it's both commercial. Um, O'Connell's development running right along here uh, on the northern edge of this long site uh, edge edge of the site is going to be 23 townhomes, and and then and that's going to sort of create a, this is a, as as sort of an island unto itself between the central business district and and the URC zone. Um, so it's it's really in, in kind of an interesting place, just just architecturally and 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 from a, a sort of a planning and 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 sort of urban point of view. Um, some of the the neighborhood images. The this is the building we're talking about, St. John Cantus. It's a you know it, it it is a lovely building and it's in a strategic spot in town. This is the the looking looking um, towards towards Bridge Street here. Holly Street off to the right. I mean, Phillips Place off to the right. This is a view from across um, across Holly Street, looking at the church, and then across from the parking lot immediately to the south. Um, these are just, you know, these are some of the uh, typical residential buildings in, in the neighborhood. Kind of an, a nice mix of of, uh, of uh, late 19th century and pre-war uh, colonials, Victorians, and uh, to federal style townhouses, um, nice scale, two, three stories, um, uh, dormers, um, a nice, you know, eclectic traditional mix of houses that are sort of making work happen in this great town. Um, these are, these are, this, this is kind of um, representative of, of, of sort of the schism of this neighborhood directly across the street from, you know, from the church, we have the, the art center here, which is a very vibrant community-based center. Then we have these two commercial buildings here um, immediately across the street from the church. And so it's existing in, it's existing in this residential world here and, and, and also in this, in this commercial sort of more downtown urban kind of, kind of a condition. Um, so it's, it's it's within this context that we're looking at, at, at trying to create an architecture that that that, that makes sense urbanistically and architecturally. Um, so this is this is the site plan that we've come up with. This is Holly Street along here, Phillips Place here, and these are these are the lines of the condominiums that are currently under construction. So you can just barely make out so the ghosted in uh, footprint of of uh, St. John Cantus. So the uh, the plan here is to create uh, six townhouse units. They would be three-story buildings with uh, with with parking in back. So you you access the parking from around the, uh, the east side of this group of townhouses, and you would pull into two car garages in back here. So it gets cars off the street, creates parking, and and creates an edge uh, along these along these buildings. It's very pedestrian friendly. The, the buildings themselves come to within, within I think five to 10 feet of the property line. So they become sort of like a, a landscaped uh, pedestrian buffer between the, the sidewalk and, and the buildings themselves. And so they, they really, they, they engage the street and they create a, a scale that I think mediates between the, the, the setbacks of the residential buildings and the rest of the neighborhood and, and, and some of, you know, some of these buildings here, which kind of face directly more on the street. Um, so, and this is, this is a, this is a very sort of gestural hand sketch, but the idea is to try and give you a sense of the scale and, and the forms of these buildings. There's a, there's a triplex here and a duplex here. We'd be trying to create an architecture that's, 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 um, that separates itself from the development currently underway, but at the same time, it's, it's forms that are recognizable and, and address the street and introduce variation, yet at the same time, having sort of the, 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 the nicer qualities of repetition that, that townhomes often have in, in urban conditions. And so this would be the view from the street with the buildings kind of stepping down with, with the topography of the street 
and then they're they along Holly Street here they would be at the same level, and the 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 concept here is to create um, a, a, a a facade elevation that sort of has a little bit of depth to it and some push and pull between the lower level and the upper level, creating bay windows and nice entrances and landscape edges at the street, sort of a consistent second story and then a third story that's where we start to see some variation in dormers and roof expressions to, again, create a certain kind of, um, I think, I think uh, uh, compatible variation between the buildings themselves and uh, 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 at the same time, uh, you know, a recognizable form. So the, again, these are, these are obviously very preliminary and we would be developing uh, uh, the concept as we, as we move forward, but in terms of the overall sort of plan and, 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 and shape and configuration of the buildings. I think, you know, we're, 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 we feel pretty good about it in terms of what we're proposing and that, um, and, and that the details will be, will be worked out such that we're creating, you know, an architecture that really is compatible with the neighborhood. Um, Matt, is there anything else um, you should be adding at this point? No, I think, I think that's right. Um, yeah, we're, we'd be willing to commit um, to the unit count, um, the size and the scale, the height. Um, but like Charles mentioned, this is, this is still um, conceptual, but we understand that there has to be the, the consistency with the surrounding area. So we would we'd be uh, willing to accept uh, a minimum density that we've proposed here as well as, as, as the, uh, the height as well. Thanks, Matt. Um, Carolyn, there's people who are waiting to, to enter. Should, do, do you have to do that or, or because I now have your screen? Does that mean No, no, I, I, I am, am operating that, so that's no problem. Okay, all right, great. Yeah, and so I, um, I just, I will also want to clarify for the um, committee and, and the public, of course, that the zoning um, allows much more density than this, and certainly the scale of and massing of the structure coming down could certainly um, support much more, um, many more units than is shown here. So um, it would be my recommendation that um, um, if the committee were to make any kind of determination about approving demolition, the requirement for approval of demolition is that there's a building or multiple buildings to replace the building and then it's in a place that meets the criteria for creating that sense of vibrancy on the street. So um, I would not recommend that you um, um, necessarily um, commit or permit a demolition based on a minimum number of units. I think it's really in your purview is about the massing and the scale and not about the number of units because zoning is what dictates the allowed number of units um, relative to parking and, and um, you know, the other safety issues that are required based on the number of units. So, um, if you think there's enough here to give you comfort, you, you mean that's part of your discussion basically is to look at the layout and the massing, but not the units. Um, and then the other thing I just want to um, remind uh, or and mention is that um, this project uh, is not is only under the jurisdiction of the Central Business Architecture Committee and not the Historical Commission. And the review is not about uh, whether or not there's a preservation of uh, um, something that's architecturally and historically significant, but about the um, um, what build, you know, buildings change over time. The Central Business Architecture Committee's review is to look at maintaining and trying to expand upon the, the downtown energy and vibrancy and making sure that we're not creating new dead spaces with the removal of buildings. Um, and that that was purposeful that the only the Central Business Architecture Committee um, looks at demolitions in the downtown um, for that for that reason. So, um... The next thing is for um, 
committee members to ask questions. Is that right? Or, and then we open it up to the public? Right. And then before you open it up to the public, you know, you might just want to run through sort of the protocols for raising hands and, um, okay. you know, so names and address. Now, um, does anybody on the committee have a question for the developers that they'd like to ask? Um, Joe, I actually, I don't have a question for the developers at this time. Um, I do want to thank the account company so much for doing such great work in Northampton and for conducting the business that they do in Northampton and for uh, the, the Northampton Planning Department's work and expertise, as well as the public um, taking the time to voice their concerns. Um, our, it's my understanding that our uh, process is to review the construction construction documents, materials, uh, um, the view from alleyways, roads, sidewalks from uh, a human scale, um, and even from the roads, as well as to uh, identify historically um, consistent materials and uh, features. Um, so with that, I looked at the um, Northampton Code of Ordinances um, subsection for demolition, that's 161-5, um, and uh, they've developed a procedure in there um, that I'm going to recommend we adopt, we meaning the um, um, CDCA, um, just because it makes sense. And I know that there's a lot of concern. Um, so what that is, is uh, to perhaps, and, and Carolyn, you could tell me um, the steps that you've taken and, the, and what other recommendation you, you have for us. Um, but I was thinking that it would be good to get the historical commission involved since they have more insight experience and jurisdiction than uh, we do in determining if it's a preferably, a preferably preserved building or structure. And um, secondly, um, to verify, and Carolyn, you can help me out on this one, if um, a determination of significance is necessary in the application. And um, thirdly, is, is the building in, and, and we briefly discussed this, Carolyn, um, is the building in or near a national registry of historic sites. And the final um, thing I'd like to mention is um, by following procedure to determine after tonight's public hearing, if it's in the public interest to preserve the building rather than demolish it um, and to determine if it's a quote unquote uh, preferably preserved building or structure, and if it's subject to the 12 month demolition review period. Sure. So, um, uh, to sort of take that um, lens of um, that the Historical Commission uses is a completely separate jurisdiction. So, only when projects are um, outside of the Central Business District. Um, there's actually, um, I will say there's one location that overlaps between Central Business Architecture and the Historical Commission, and that one parcel is St. Mary's, which unfortunately no one's found a reuse for that church either. But that is the only place in the entire city where the Central Business um, uh, District boundary overlaps the Historical Commission, that's the Elm Street district so that because that's a district that's why the historical commission would review a demolition of saint mary's in addition to the central business architecture committee reviewing the demolition of saint mary's um, nobody's come forward with a demolition plan for saint mary's that's not what i'm suggesting here i'm just wanted to clarify that um, in this case because this structure is wholly within the Central Business Architecture Committee. There is no review by the Historical Commission and you do not, the Central Business Architecture Committee does not have 
the legal authority to use the language that's specified about whether mm -hmm. or not a property is preferably preserved. Your the language that you are bound to um, use in terms of your review is um, in 156 in the design guidelines, and it specifically talks about demolition of historic buildings. Okay. And um, what it says is that for historic landmark or theme buildings, demolition should be considered only when the building is unusable or is functionally and structurally obsolete. And when an appropriate, so and when an appropriate new building has been designed to replace it. Demolition of, um, and then it goes on to talk about demolition of um, other types of buildings um, under with that same evaluation. So the committee must determine that they have enough information from the applicant that um, it's functionally and structurally obsolete and that there's another building to replace it. So you, the only way you could deny a demolition is if you found that they did not do enough to show you that there wasn't a reuse available or a rehab, um, that there are no other reasonable alternatives for rehabilitation of the building. Um, and there, and it's only after reasonable alternatives have been evaluated and then determined that they're not accessible for the applicant. Um, the only way that, so if that is not to be found or if there's no building to replace it, like there's a parking lot only, or there's no plan for anything on the site, then the Central Business Architecture Committee could deny a project for demolition. But if there's enough evidence to show that reasonable alternatives don't exist for the reuse or rehab, and the building is functionally and structurally obsolete, and there's a building to to replace it, then you can, then you are obligated to approve the permit. Um, there's no demolition delay as under historical commission review. So none of that piece is um, relevant to your evaluation. Um, the, uh, the, tr the, the, the piece of this project, which has not, um, which is a little more complicated is that they have a concept for design, but they're not saying we're building this and here are the materials and here are the number of stories and here are the, here's the final massing. Um, so um, they're basically asking for a phased approval, one for demolition with a concept and then coming back to you for final approval of a plan. So at the concept level, you could look at um, again, whether there's enough massing here to make up for the loss of that significant landmark building um, at, or whether they need to build a little bit more into it. And that's the only way they're going to get their permit. Um, the other piece is, you know, it's possible, it's entirely possible that you allow demolition, they go in and demo and then nothing gets built for five or 10 years. And then you have this big gaping hole in the fabric of the neighborhood. And so that's that actually happened with the other church project on King Street, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, that was under the church ownership that that project went forward and there's been no building to replace the historic building that came down. Um, so the only sort of the one tool that you might think about that you could use, I'm not suggesting that you necessarily have to use it, but if there's a concern that maybe this concept just isn't fleshed out enough and maybe what happens if the market tanks further and they can't even, um, they demolish the building and then they just, it sits there for a long time. You could also require a bond to be posted of some amount that if they don't build in X number of years, then that money goes to the city that the city can determine you know, how to, then facilitate getting something to fill that void, which we don't have on King Street. But again, that was a, a church developing the property versus a private developer in this case. And then to answer your question about the um, whether or not this is a, this is clearly an historical building, the the downtown district is on the National Register, but that doesn't really come into play or doesn't have any effect 
on anything unless public money is put into the redevelopment of a project. And then at that point, that triggers um, a requirement that renovations um, are done in accordance with the Secretary of Interior standards for renovating and modifying historic structures. So the designation, whether it's a, on the National Registry or not, really doesn't play into your role about um, uh, demolition review. And now being there are only three, three of us here to vote on this, um, is it a major, majority rule? Is it, you know? Actually in this case, because you're down to the bare minimum, it has to be a unanimous vote. You have to be, yep. okay, all right. I just feel, you know, is I feel at this point, um, the only, the only way that I could vote would be to see more concrete, you know, specific plans. I mean, to go on just, you know, a preliminary schematic, which is what this is, I, I uh, wouldn't be able to uh, vote in the affirmative for this. And I think that maybe it would be also more helpful to have the other voting members present, um, you know, so that because this is a huge project, um, and so I think that there should, you know, I think we should really have a, um, you know, a f everyone in attendance to vote on this. I think it's that, you know, it's that important. Well, let me just clarify so that you really only have one more eligible member who can vote on this. Um, Bob Walker, I thought he was going to be able to come tonight. I mean, that's, I wanted to make sure we scheduled because I knew that the remaining members have conflicts of interest. Ah. in some shape or form with this project. Mm -hmm. So um, your total count is four, mm -hmm. no matter what. And um, for whatever reason, Bob could not join us um, tonight. All right. Um, Pauline, I thought that was a great, that's a great suggestion. And I even, I mean, if it is possible, I would even suggest waiting for Bob to come in because he provides valuable insight being a long time resident also. A resident also. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there you might uh, you might want to mull that over and think about it as you take public comment. Um, it would be possible to continue the meeting to if you felt that was necessary, and then Bob could review the record and then come in as a as a voting member. But obviously, that's up to you all to to decide. Mm -hmm. um, a question to the developer, Matt. Um, you mentioned the return on investment um, for the, I think the four units were 4,000 monthly um, rent, I think is what you were saying. I was wondering if you could maybe do a comparison between the two of the one that you're proposing, the 23 units and the other, I think it was con condos or something like that. So I'm, um, I'm not entirely sure um, what, what you're asking, um, the, the, the townhomes on the, the phase one of the 23 townhomes are for sale. Um, mm -hmm. the comparison that I used, um, apologize if I wasn't clear, but was more just to represent the break even and, uh, uh, and at $4,000 per month per unit, that would be in essence, the amount that would be necessary to, to break even. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the other thing too, I'm, just, I'm not convinced that, you know, post COVID is going to see Northampton not being able to support uh, more restaurants or more retail space. I think that uh, Northampton is really resilient given the fact that our, I think our main industry is education and Smith College is in town. And where I do uh, understand that offices may not be making a great comeback because people have been successful working from home, I do feel I have, I'm bullish on Northampton in that I do think it's going to make a comeback as far as retail and restaurants um, and commercial space. And, um, 
you know, were you going uh, to demolish a historic and significant uh, building, um, I, would, I would rather see some sort of reuse, uh, you know, I would prefer reuse of the existing building than building more a residential space. And um, I'm not convinced that your argument that uh, post COVID, you know, won't support uh, a thriving, thriving retail and commercial, uh, you know, uh, space, uh, commercial businesses in that church, if it can, if that would be part of the reuse solution there. May I respond? Go right ahead. Oh, uh, so I, just to to address some of the comments on uh, on being bullish on Northampton and the viability of of restaurants, we, we do think that there is an opportunity that the the market will recover and will respond eventually. Um, mm -hmm. The issue is that uh, with the the deferred maintenance that exists at the building. Mm -hmm. um, in order to bring the, the building shell to a point in which we could market, um, we would be um, spending nearly $800,000. And when that gets added to the rent that's necessary to attract tenants, we would be probably somewhere in the 40 to, to low $50 per square foot. And we're not aware of, uh, of any retail establishment within the city that has supported that type of rent. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in when you made your, when you had your offer accepted, um, you know, and you had mentioned, you know, your hope to, you hope to uh, preserve the building and find a reuse for it. I would have expected that you would have done some due diligence and looked into what it would take to, uh, you know, to preserve the building and to bring it up to, uh, you know, safety and code standards. Yeah, we, we did um, conduct a due diligence on the building, um, but there are time limits that are associated with that. And um, there are what, I'm sorry. There, is, there are some time limitations that were part of that contract. Uh -huh. um, that prevented us from possibly doing more. And then also um, prevented us from doing full environmental and remediation analysis on the building. Um, that's, that's typically not uh, standard during due diligence. And um, once we did acquire the property, we did uncover uh, significant uh, hazardous materials and um, asbestos uh, related materials in the building um, that truthfully are, are unforeseen. Mm -hmm. But those are going to have to be removed by a professional, you know, professional company anyway, whether you repurpose it or you're going to demolish it. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, the, the only thing that I would say is that uh, if we're comparing the two scenarios, adding the amount of the, the uh, remedia remediation abatement um, to the cost to um, improve the existing building, um, your starting point is much higher under that scenario than you would if you were to demolish and build a new. Can I ask um, how much um, outreach to potential restaurant clients you did in, um, you know, in, you know, b even before the pandemic um, happened, I was the, um, did you, did you have any interest um, from restaurant people in a location like that? Uh, we, we did have um, some, in um, a, a Boston area restaurant tour who, who thought this could be a potential um, yeah, I'll talk to you later. Restaurant and uh, live music venue. And once uh, COVID hit, had kind of retracted and said they're 
they're no longer in any expansion mode and would be essentially uh, sitting foot for the time being with no, no uh, timeline on when they would uh, look to reevaluate the property. And that's been consistent with all the other uh, breweries and restaurateurs that, that we've talked to. They've said um, there's, there's no plans in the near future to look at new, new acquisitions and not at 6,300 square feet. I wonder if you, did you talk to Jim Olson at all of Signature Sound? Cause I, you know, he had a deal to buy a property on Con Street that fell through um, because of COVID, but it's, I don't, I don't know if somebody like him would be interested in something like this once the pandemic um, uh, was over. Not that I'm aware of. No, I, I don't think we did, we did not speak to him. Um, and how many residential units did you think you might be able to fit in there if you if it would be applicable to uh, if it would be possible to do four, possibly five. So two bedroom or three bedroom. Probably a mix of one and two bedroom. Uh -huh. And how many levels could? Probably be two, two levels. It would be probably a mix of uh, single story and then potentially two story. Uh -huh. So the, like on the upper level, you could have had something with balconies or something because you could have really high ceilings. Not necessarily balcony, but uh, to take advantage of the, of the ceilings, yes. Um, does anybody on the committee have um, other questions or comments? So I, I think now we need to open it up to the um, general public who's here. And um, um, Carolyn is kind of in charge of the um, uh, um, uh, uh, procedure. I want to make sure everybody stays muted. Somebody was unmuted and got a telephone call a couple minutes ago and it kind of interfered with things. So please make sure if, if you're not speaking that you are muted. Um, but if you raise your hand, Carolyn can see it and she'll call on people in the order that they raise their hands. Carolyn, should I stop sharing? Um, sure, that would be um, fine. And then just to reminder that when people, uh, before people speak, if they could um, state their name and address for the record. Um, so first, I think this is Jim Nash. I'm gonna go ahead. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, hello, uh, my name is Jim Nash. I'm the Ward 3 City Councilor. And um, I come here today uh, to speak to, you know, this uh, sad circumstance that we're, we're all facing right here with this iconic and striking structure. Um, I want to first uh, 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 speak to um, the folks at O'Connell. Uh, Matt, uh, you know, and I have had some discussions uh, that have been cordial. Uh, also, um, I, over the years with uh, Andrew Crystal, um, that the, the relationship has been positive. I also want to note that, um, that a partner company of O'Connell has also had a number of successful affordable housing uh, 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 work in Northampton, specifically Live 155, and also the Sergeant House. And I wouldn't, I, I just throw that out there to note that O'Connell has, um, has done some creative and uh, innovative uh, housing, affordable housing um, for our city before. Um, and, and they're not unfamiliar with our housing needs. Um, so I, I wanna be, First, I, I'd like to acknowledge what the city has done to preserve this property, that, uh, that we extended uh, central business uh, under the direction of uh, 
senior land planner, uh, Carolyn Mish, to include this, per, this property here. Because under central business, it allows for a range of uses that in particular would have been, are helpful to preserving a structure such as the church. That in a, it, it was pr prior to the rezoning, it was part of uh, URC. And that really limited the types of uses that could go on there. By being central business, we can talk about entertainment. We can talk about restaurants. We can talk about uh, uh, hotels and um, and options that um, that are th that could work in this location. Um, that um, that so. My history with this project as counselor um, that uh, Andrew Crystal and I had a, um, a, a neighborhood meeting back in October of 2019, invited neighbors there where um, uh, O'Connell presented their plans for uh, 23 condos that um, are now under construction on the property. Um, at that meeting, I point blank asked uh, uh, Mr. Crystal, you know, um, first I stated that the people in the room here, my, our neighbors, it was attended by about 50 people that, um, we would like to see the church preserved. Yes, we understand that, you know, that there, these, these, uh, residential units are probably going to go in, but we're, we we really want to see the church preserved. Can you commit to that at this point? And the response was, we are interested in saving, preserving the church, but we cannot commit to that at this time. Um, when this went to, when the 23 condos went to the planning board, I stood up and I supported the project and I repeated my request for a commitment around um, to preserve the church. And again, the response was that we can't commit to that at this time. And um, here we are tonight at this juncture, and I am again um, imploring that O'Connell uh, Development Group consider um, delaying this decision to, um, to demolition the church. And I, I am asking that the demolition um, uh, be delayed for a year. And, I, and, I, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to go into that a bit here, that um, I, I agree with the assessment of uh, members of this committee that, um, that uh, you know, I too believe in Northampton and its ability to recover, that um, I've seen people having pleasant, fine dining experiences in curbsides and in parking lots that the desire to of the folks of Northampton and this region to get back to normal is extremely strong and that we can't wait for the moment to actually get out there and, and start living the, the lives that we were living just 12 months ago. Um, so I, I, I too am bullish on Northampton. I also want to acknowledge that um, within the, uh, the, 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 the challenge that uh, O'Connell Development Group is facing because of some language that's been embedded in the deed by the prior owner, that the, that the uh, whatever uh, uses need to comport with the teachings of the Catholic Church. And um, that I, I think that those uh, that language is onerous. And I, I just like to read some remarks here. I would like to propose before any decision is arrived at, that there be a meeting with the diocese to discuss the deed restriction to clarify intent. Tomorrow, I will be calling on the Bishop to arrange such a meeting. Former Ward 3 City Councilor Maria Tomasco has expressed a desire to join me and I will take her up on that, that offer. If members of the O'Connell Development Group would like to join us, they are welcome as well. As worded, 
the diocese has embedded a deed restriction that is an enormous red flag that no investor would want any part of. Imagine if we approach John Paul II or Pope Francis about the wording, any use that is inconsistent with the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, would we get different answers about what would be allowed in this building? I think so. Now just imagine what goes through the heads of potential investors. This language is unclear, it needs to be better delineated, or better yet, it needs to be removed. I have also learned that these restrictions as worded can be contested in court. In the view of people I have spoken with, these restrictions are likely not on, on firm legal ground. The language is not a prohibition, but a legal roadblock that brings this building to the brink today. And it's been hung around the, the neck of this building since it went on the market back in 2010. I have also learned that restrictions on properties such as this have time limits and do not last in perpetuity. In Massachusetts, such restrictions can, ex can expect to last for 30 years. With the, sale, with the sale just last year, these restrictions have only 29 more years to go. Surely a church that is over 2000 years old it's not really going to fuss about XXIX years or 29 years. That, um, that this, this is a, a, a situation that requires a rethinking. And I don't think that the, the Catholic, that the diocese really wants this building to be torn down. And I, I think that they need to rethink the way they've handled this. And I would like to talk to them about it. And um, in closing, I, I would just like to say, I wanna recognize the, the, the Polish community and what it has meant to uh, my ward, Ward 3, where this church resides. That St. John Cantius Church was born of the vision of, of immigrants who came to this country, to the, to the valley. And it, this was this church was the center of the Polish community in our area. It was a vibrant and um, and 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 wonderful addition. And the 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 members of the Polish community are everywhere, including we have a Polish mayor. So I would like to say that um, I I I hope that um, that. I, I, I'm hoping that the, the committee will vote in some way to push this off, but more so I am imploring to the folks at O'Connell um, and, and Matt, who I've had some very good discussions with, that we put this on hold for a bit, we really research things, and that we, be, we speak to the, to the diocese, and we also remain bullish on Northampton. Thank you. Before the next person comes on, um, we're, it'd, be, it'd be good if we could keep our comments to three or four minutes, because um, otherwise we're gonna could be here all night. I think the um, the, di the diocese in Springfield has has proven themselves to be very inflexible and and uh, uh, about anything that they. Um, uh, uh, have opinions on, and I, I don't think I don't think that's an avenue that's going to go anywhere. To be honest with you, anyway, could could the next? It's time for the next uh, person. Um, so I have Carlos, and you said three minutes. Is that what you said, Joe? Try yeah, try and keep it to three or four minutes, because it, otherwise okay. it, it could be a really long. <laughs> so somebody have the stop clock. I mean, somebody checking. So I'm Carlos McBride. I live literally right across the street, um, 17 Harley Street. And, you know, it's really frustrating to hear what's happening with this or the potential uh, for this building for many reasons. Um, I'm out here finishing up my PhD at UMass. I'm raising my daughter by myself, who's five. And I don't, I don't see 
I mean, I keep hearing vibrant and, you know, what, what this could do for, for downtown. I mean, we have right up the street, we have these townhomes that have been just sitting there for how, how long? You know, um, I'm not, look, I'm not trying to t attack the integrity of, of, of Mr. Welter, the profession of, of O'Connell. You know, I, I, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't add up for me, you know, and, and I feel like, you know, if, 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 if you've been around for at least 100 years, you would know that when you're getting into a situation, some kind of a business opportunity or what have you, you know that you're going to, you know, the risks that are involved or in, in, in the repurposing of this building for me would be more ideal given the fact that we already have this construction across the street, given the fact that, you know, affordable housing really isn't going to exist around here anymore. I mean, I'm coming from Brooklyn where, you know, diversity was heavy, but now you can't even live there anymore, you know? And, and this, is, this is what I feel like Cause I mean, I'm out, you know, I'm out here because I want my daughter to be in a good school system, you know, and, and I don't walk around this community feeling like people look at me like I'm a part of this community or like I'm a community leader or like I'm an educator, right? People don't look at me like that, but you know, I, I, I understand what my purpose is, you know, I'm committed to what, you know, to, to being a part of this community, to, to I'm committed to, to, you know, bringing diversity to this community, but you know, the idea of, of tearing this place down for a four thousand dollar, you know, to meet a four thousand dollar a month, you know, bill just to break even, it it, it it makes me feel nauseous, you know, you know, to think that you know, somebody, you know, an organization that's been around for over a hundred years cannot come up with some kind of a collaborative idea of 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 repurposing that, you know, that that landmark building. And we've seen pictures of this neighborhood, you know, that those pictures are probably gonna be far and few in between the way things are going, it seems, you know? And COVID hit everybody. You know, COVID has affected everyone, right? So, you know, I just, you know, I, I'm not trying to throw spears here, right? But, you know, I'm, I'm, I live here, you know, and, and I, and I want it, you know, I just wanted to be known that, you know, it's, it's really frustrating that, you know, it's really about, you know, the, the figures and the commas, you know, in reference to what happens to this, to this uh, piece of property. And, you know, I, you know, I appreciate what I, you know, some of the things that have been brought up in response to this, you know, I'm not a business person, I'm an educator, but, you know, taking this building down to add more real estate right next to the real estate that has been going on for the last year is, is just, you know, it, it doesn't make me feel, it doesn't make me feel good, you know? And, you know, I'm just one person, one voice, but, you know, I'll be damned if I'm gonna walk around feeling like that's gonna add to the community that I feel like I'm trying to belong to. So I appreciate the time, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next person is uh, Fred. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Fred Zimlock. I live in Ward 3B, and I've prepared a few words to say about the church. My grandfather came here from Poland in 1902, he was transporting his niece and nephew to their mother who lived in East Hampton. Leaving the Russian partition of Poland, where people were struggling with poverty and hopeless future, he wisely remained to stay here. As a carpenter, he quickly found work with O'Connell and Sons. And a short time later, a wife who left the Kingdom of Poland. Arriving in 1903, his future wife found work at Bay State Hotel and lived with her cousin in Mount Town before marrying my grandfather in 1906 at St. John Cantius Parish. It is clear from the size of the community center that could hold 300 yeah. diners that the church prospered for many years. Losing this building is just another blow to erasing an important part of the city's history 
but also the lives of the many parishioners who contributed economically and shared their ebullient social life. But it can be done. Witness the re restructuring of the old USPO, the NIS, the First National Bank building, and of course the railroad station. Yet I know that people who visit Europe for the first time always on returning comment on the host of historic buildings they visited, yet they come home to see historic buildings being destroyed. This raises the question for me of why our city ordinance makes historic buildings in a commercial business zone exempt from the 100 year historic review. To prevent this loss, I suggest that ODG commit to extending the time to discover new ways of preserving the building in light of the fact that our pandemic is now waning. I might add that my grandfather's great granddaughter, Erica, was married in this church in October 2000, not only in order to preserve the history of her family, but because she and her husband thought that the architectural style was so wonderful. I would also hope that our mayor, Narkowitz, who I know respects the history of his ancestors, would support my idea for continuation of a review of possible other uses of this building. Thank you very much. I would also like to say that Maria Tomasco is here and she would like to speak too. Thank you. If I can say just a very few things, um, I would like to say um, I was city councilor when, um, uh, well, for a number of years. And when the idea came up about having the, um, um, the condos, uh, we, worked with the people who were proposing the condos. And um, in the end, um, uh, we had agreed upon having the condos, um, giving up part of the church land, the rectory land, uh, so that the condos could be put in. But we were very committed to keeping the church. And somehow that idea has vanished. And I, um, I'm, I'm wondering exactly why it vanished and who precisely um, is behind this because we had all sorts of specific information about keeping the church. And what Fred just said about the importance of the church um, is completely true that this is a place where people who are Polish can come together. And we're not going to be able to rebuild the building and redesign it and, uh, and change um, the way we use the building. But when we do, it seems to me that one of the rooms we need is a room for people to come together and gather. And my guess is that if we have such a room, in this rehabilitated church. Um, my guess is that that may very well be a place where people with a Polish heritage will come and spend time together. Um, there's a lot more things I could say, but I will, so to speak, um, pass the gavel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next, I just see N. Wooters. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Nathan Wooters. I live at uh, 17 Holly Street uh, across the street from the church. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I gotta be honest, when I came into this meeting, I thought that the demolition of the church was a done deal. So I was sort of operating on that assumption. Uh, so I don't pretend to have any opinion about that about whether it's more effective to repurpose or whether it's more effective to demolish. But I think if you're going to get rid of the church, you should 
you should put something good in your life. Uh, and I think putting five townhouses that will likely be empty for a very long time uh, is not a good use of that space. Is not, I don't think we need more empty property in this town. Uh, and I think, you know, I, you know, I find it interesting that this conversation talks of like aesthetics and how the townhouses would look when I think like the building that I live in, which, you know, is commercial, uh, I, you know, I have an upstairs neighbor, I have a downstairs neighbor, and I think I live very comfortably. When I moved in here, I, I felt like I had a real, I, I really like this place. I don't think you need, I don't think we need space that's not going to be used. And I think there needs to be an opportunity for uh, lower income people to move into this community. And I think we should have, if we're going to get rid of this space, we should, the church, there should be affordable housing, uh, low income housing uh, to make, to make it worthwhile. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Kate Friedman. Uh, you need to unmute. Hi. Um, my name is Kate Friedman. Um, I too live at uh, 17 Holly. Um, I own unit 303. Um, and I, um, I, um, I agree with Jim um, that I, we should put this on hold for a minute. Um, I, I also um, agree with um, with the council person who talked about the idea of um, being bullish on Northampton. Um, I don't know if you saw in the uh, New York Times today, but um, there was just a big article about how economists are expecting a boom post pandemic. Um, I'm also a historian, so I know that um, typically booms do follow pandemics. Um, and I expect that is, that's exactly what's gonna happen here, especially you know, because of all the, the um, stimulus that um, has been put into the economy. Um, and I also have um, a prepared statement, um, which actually is pretty in line with um, what Carlos and Nate have talked about, um, which is that I'm not um, someone who ever went to this church, um, but I do look at the church every day. Um, and you know, it is valuable to me from that perspective. Um, I'm really sorry um, that you um, in the O'Connell Development Group find yourself in a, in a difficult financial spot with this project. Um, but I also do think that you took a known risk in taking on this project. Um, and I don't think that it should be the community's job to absorb that risk. Um, if that sounds like nimbyism, um, then let me say that I would be really open to hearing a suggestion from you that would create more affordable housing in this space, um, because I think that that's what this community really needs. Um, and you know what we've heard so far tonight is that this church clearly, that's what it did. It created community. And I think um, you know housing of, um, varying incomes in this neighborhood is part of what creates community um, and particularly affordable housing um, because as we all know um, it is very hard to afford to live in this city if you happen to be one of the service workers who works in this city um, and so you know if you were thinking about building affordable housing um, in that space, I, I would feel differently um, about what is being proposed. Um, so that's, that's the opening that you have from me. 
Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, um, John Dunn. Hi, <clears throat> hi everybody. Can you hear me okay? I hope so. Yes. Um, yeah, so thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm John Dunn, I live at 211 State Street and I'm here to address the uh, destruction of St. John, Kansas. Um, I've been involved in developing affordable housing and incidentally preserving historic buildings in Massachusetts and Connecticut for about 30 years. And two of these buildings happened to be in Northampton and both were close to the end of their usefulness um, when the community discovered ways to preserve them and to keep them as community resources for years to come. Uh, one was around the corner on 82 Bridge Street and one was on, uh, on New South Street. Um, so first, let's be clear. Uh, this is a significant building. It's beautiful. Uh, as we've just heard, <laughs> very uh, poignantly, it tells a story of our city's past. It's right in the middle of an important neighborhood surrounded by historic buildings on Bridge Street, Pomeroy Terrace. It is odd that it, there's, it's not part of an historic district, but I, I didn't make up those districts, but there are historic buildings. If I went up into the tower, I'd probably see uh, many historic buildings by just looking a little bit to the, to the east and a little bit to the south. But the culture, the work, you know, the history that went into this building and the, the diversity of our past, they're all here to see right in this building. It's too important to rush to destroy something like this. I think it's been there since 1904. Um, now, there are other possible uses of the building rather than bulldozing it and putting up luxury houses. Uh, we should be exploring those uses. So people have talked about art space, restaurants, affordable housing, a community center. Lots of ideas have begun to be generated, uh, prompted by the developers request to demolish the building. Uh, I first heard of the de demolition on Thursday um, and I, I'm actually surprised I, that it's so soon actually after the purchase of the building, which is, you know, it's less than a year. Um, but since then, just doing a little work, you know, for my computer, I found many, many examples of positive reuses of similar buildings all over Massachusetts, all over the United States, and especially, you know, in, in Europe. So, and as uh, Jim pointed out, O'Connell knows how to do these kinds of things. They've done lots of good projects that have positive community impact. And I'm not saying that the one that they're proposing here has no positive impact, but when you're talking about taking away a public resource, we ought to be planning to replace it with another public resource. So I believe if a delay of, a, of 12 months could give time for proposals to develop. This is a minimum, I think, for a building that has stood there in the community for over a century. Uh, you know, one of the arguments for demolition is that the current market for anything but luxury housing, which this is, uh, is too weak. But really, should we base decisions that'll change the character of a neighborhood on a temporary economic downturn? Is that really visionary? Is that sustainability? And while we're on the topic of it, let, let's not forget the sheer waste of putting materials in a landfill when they could be reused right where they are. You wanna do green building, then start by not tearing things down. Uh, regarding the cost of renovations needed, it, uh, I'm, I am a little surprised at the cost. I, is the roof leaking? Um, is, it, is it true that this building deteriorated that rapidly? That surprises me because, and I'm not, I'm not challenging you, but that, it surprises me since most diocesan buildings are fairly well maintained. Uh, did the city con consider it a uh, dangerous structure or do they now consider it dangerous? I don't know the answers to those questions. So I hope the committee will give St. John Cantus a stay of execution and give the community time to figure out how to get it done. 
There are sources of funds, historic credits, federal, state, new market tax credits, many others to encourage private investment in these kinds of things. And now, I don't know if, it, if O'Connell has explored all these options. Uh, I, I just don't know. Um, just the building has served the public for over 100 years. The developer proposes something that will only benefit a few people. They've not explored the many possibilities. Well, I don't think so. Not Some not without profit that might allow this building to continue to be a public good far into the future. So thanks for letting me talk. 12 months is all we're asking. Um, Faye Wolf. Hi, I, I uh, want to take a slightly different tack. I'm a neighbor. My name is Faye Wolf. I live at 28 Phillips Place. Uh, I, I'm going to sound sacrilegious here. I don't have a, a whole lot of affection for the church. Um, I think it's, a, it's great to have a historic church in the neighborhood, but uh, I'm not wedded to seeing it last forever. I'm a little concerned when people <clears throat> have raised questions about possibly having a nightclub or a live music venue there because I think the neighbors will agree with me that uh, Bishop's Lounge is very audible or was until the pandemic. That's one sort of silver lining to the pandemic that we no longer hear Bishop's Lounge music, music at midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock. Uh, on every weekend. So I, I would like to urge that when people think about this use, they remember that this is a residential neighborhood. There are houses all around this property. There are people who live across the street whom we've heard from. And so certain, I think certain uses should just not be on the table. Uh, Secondly, I'm curious about the timetable uh, when this demolition might take place. <clears throat> this is off the, uh, the point of the committee, but there is a colony of chimney swifts living in the church chimney and they nest starting in April and they are there until September. And during that time, according to a federal law, there is no demolition. Demolition really can't proceed. Uh, destruction of nests, injury or murder of, killing of animals, birds, just uh, cannot happen legally. So I'd like to know when the demolition would take place possibly and how long it would last and what remediation, if worse comes to worse and the church has to come down, how the developers would address that question. I realize that may not be a question for this committee, but I would just like to go on record with it. Uh, and uh, I'm also a little concerned about the discussion of massing and number of units. Uh, we have 23 townhouses going up behind us and five more sort of just sort of fits into the mix as far as I can see, but I would not like to see the character of this neighborhood altered significantly architecturally, where you have two-story buildings and some three-story buildings on Holly, and suddenly you have a hulking mass of building right up to the property line, which has happened in this city. It's happened all over the place. And uh, I just would like to see that whatever is built is consistent with what we have in the neighborhood. So thank you. Okay, Claudia Lefko. Hi, you hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, 40, Valley, 40 Valley Street, right across the street from Jim Nash, actually. I basically want to support what others have said about putting the, uh, a halt to this for at least a year. Um, and just say how frustrating it is to live in this neighborhood in Northampton, which is a very, very crowded neighborhood, not only crowded with people living in houses, but crowded with the fairground, with the airport, 
with 33 Holly Street. We have so many things in Ward 3, and it just seems like there can't be enough added, that we're always facing the possibility of more things being added. People have talked about the structure, but what I loved about this corner is the big grassy lawn and the tree that was there. And in the nice weather, people would sit there and eat their lunch. They would sit there and talk. It was kind of a meeting place. And so we're losing the church, but we're also losing that sense of open space and community. I was on the board of the Center for the Arts when uh, the building went for sale. And the, board, the Center for the Arts, which is different than 33 Holly Street, um, was very interested and had money to invest in the property and, was, and wanted to buy it. And the people, the real estate people who had it for sale would, were giving us the impression that there was an RFP. Like, yes, the building was for sale, but they were going to look for the best match of buyer. And honestly, you know, if you imagine Holly Street now without 33 Holly Street, I think the Center for the Arts would have been a great match for, for the neighborhood, but alas, it didn't happen. They actually weren't interested in using it in my, my mind. They didn't imagine it for, with the best match, whatever. They were just wanting to, to sell it to, maybe to a higher bidder or whatever. So now we're in the position where we have 33 Holly Street, which is a thriving, hopefully, center for the arts and also brings a lot of noise you know, to the neighborhood and traffic and whatever. So I don't have any, any brilliant solution to add. I would just say that I, I would like to go back to the idea of the RFP because maybe what we want in there is some sort of a pocket park and maybe there's some chance that the city, like I know it doesn't come under historic uh, purview because there's no private public partnership, but why isn't, why couldn't there be a public partnership? Why couldn't the city, given how much I feel like the zoning has oppressed Ward 3, I feel like the city could join to give something back to us like, you know, like join with uh, these developers to issue some sort of a RFP to come up with a very creative, some public private partnership that maybe, I mean, I don't know, we need a com community meeting space. We need daycare in the center. This is a stone building, you know, I was worked in many a daycare that was in a church basement over my time. So there are a lot of ideas. And I think the fact that there are birds there just adds to this idea that we should save it and make it a park of some sort or whatever. So I don't, um, I guess my, er, my uh, statement, it's very odd talking into the screen like this, but my statement is to, to, to stop rushing, stop pushing all this building onto us here in Ward 3. Really, it, it's just more than, I was at the meeting where the 50 participants were that Jim talked about. Nobody there wanted the ones that are already going up. I mean, nobody did. And I feel very badly for the Phillips Place people all who live in historic buildings. I mean, talk about historic buildings. The street, the neighborhood is exquisite. And now we're having this to deal with. So I, I won't continue my rant, but I call for an RFP. I call for a delay and perhaps a public partner, um, private public partnership. So thanks a lot. That's it, I'm done. Um, Eric Cherry. Hi. Yes, thanks. Uh, and sorry, I can't uh, use my video right now. <laughs> um, but I, I had, I guess, just a clarification uh, question. So this would be really short. Um, I was very surprised that there, there's that much repair needed, um, around $800,000, I think was the number. Um, and I can see how that would be a real hindrance for reusing the building. But I guess to make that number um, really informative, and I'm sorry if I missed that, I don't know what the cost, the overall cost of the housing project would be that would be replacing it, just to put that number in perspective. Because if you're spending, you know, 1.5 million or 2 million on tearing it down plus rebuilding a structure, then that $800,000 to get it into reusable shape, um, you know, is small in comparison. So 
I guess that's just the clarification that I had. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see anybody else's hands raised at the moment. So I don't know if the, uh, uh, there is one person here, Helen. And also Carolyn, um, Terrence, Terry's been raising his hand too. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Helen, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time. I kind of agree with what was said, especially with our counselor, Jim Nash. Uh, I've been a pastoral minister at St. John Cantius when it merged to one, uh, two, one priest for two parishes. And I worked very closely with the Polish people. Um, and they were very dedicated. They they did everything they could, even the elderly at 80 and 90 years old, they would, we would have projects that they would want to have suppers to support the church. And they also supported the community when we had the, uh, you know, feeding the hungry, many of them volunteered to feed. And uh, so, and they are, they are heartbroken about this decision. Uh, some of them have called me because they know me from my job here. And they're very heartbroken because they said they were promised by the construction company that they were going to do something with the building and <laughs> not tear it down. So um, again, I agree with the others, please consider take time and maybe think of a project of feeding the hungry, a building to, to use. We don't have places to use outside of the senior center, which is limited. And uh, I can speak on behalf of the mayor too. He's interested and concerned about the homeless and the ones that are, are hungry working, walking in the street. So I agree likewise. And I thank you people for looking into this and you're doing a great job. And please consider our plea to wait at least a year till you decide to demolish. Thank you so much. Thank you. I guess, uh, Terry. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Th thanks for the chance to speak for a few seconds. I, I won't be long. Um, I had written a letter with a lot of supporting materials um, for this cause, if you will, um, and had no idea that um, I would see this much support for the church and it really makes me feel great because I too would hate to see this church um, disappear. Um, so if anyone looks at the document file for today's meet this evening's meeting, they can see my letter, um, which has a lot of supporting materials um, to show comparative repurposed properties within the city of Northampton and a lot of residential church conversions within the state of Massachusetts. Um, and to that end, I would also go a step further to say that within Pittsfield, there's a very talented um, construction developer named Dave Carver, who has converted, I don't know, four, five, six churches in Pittsfield into residential apartments. And I think if you need to do research on positive models, um, that's a good place to start. I would also say that it's not to wave a magic wand and say, oh, make the money go away. These are economic transactions where there's cost, there's expenses, there's renovation costs, and those numbers really need to be worked out so that there's not an imposition on the developer uh, to take a burden that's more than they should bear. But at the same time, we know that if we merge private sector ability to contribute to a project with the public sector resources that are available and the tax credits that are available, maybe you can hit common ground and find a way to uh, creatively adapt um, this, this church. So that, that's my, my final comment is that I'm really glad I think there might be a path forward for everybody to work together and talk together. And again, I really appreciate the comments from everyone and including um, those from Councillor Nash as well. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, there's another hand raised, uh, JP. Uh, 
I would like to echo the comments of the many individuals who have spoken very eloquently this evening uh, on behalf of the neighborhood uh, in 3B, on behalf of Holly Street, on behalf of Ward 3. Uh, I believe that there is a positive uh, future, not only for uh, our neighborhood, but for Northampton. I do believe that uh, after the pandemic of 1918, 1919, what did we see? The roaring 20s. And I hope that this city can take the time to honor the historic property that is right in the downtown area and can allow for the most uh, stringent review allowed by the city to repurpose the building. And I do hope that it can be preserved. I own property on the street. I grew up on the street. Uh, so I do have uh, an interest in seeing this uh, go well for the city and for uh, the neighborhood. Thank you so much. And by the way, let me just say, I know how hard everyone works during the pandemic to maintain all your efforts toward good government. Thank you so much for being there and for your hard work. Thank you. Um, Chris Metcalf has his hand raised. Okay. I'm going to turn off my video because I'm on the week. Um, just real brief. Um, I was hired by the original developer of this project to uh, do historic uh, preservation on the church. I've been all through it multiple times. I've designed a restaurant that would fit into it. The original project was urban senior living, which I guess is no longer on the table, but it would have been a restaurant that would have served all the seniors living in all those units. And then it would also be open to the public. But I guess the point I would like to make is that um, the historic preser preservation tax credits that would be easily available here um, up to say 39% of the cost. Uh, um, so basically, again, the preservation through uh, store tax credits would certainly be able to um, make this viable, um, whatever the use, you know, residential or community space. And the last point would be that in terms of the downtown um, central business review guidelines, which kind of replace the historic district. So that's why there's no demolition delay. Um, but the building as it is matches the central business a lot better than those townhouses, um, especially directly across the street, two masonry structures. Um, I think it definitely should be preserved. I think it's lost to be. Um, uh, you know, there's words I would use that I, you know, would be harsher than, than, but it would be a serious loss to civilization. I mean, a serious loss. I mean, churches are some of the most wonderful pieces of architecture on the planet. They're disappearing. They need to be preserved. And it's easy to try to do it. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, unless someone, uh, uh, Fred, oh no, he's clapping. Um, okay. I don't see any other hands raised. So, um, so I guess the committee needs to talk among, we need to talk amongst ourselves about this. Um, I, um, did, would anybody, would any of us, um, actually, I should probably close the public hearing now. Is that right? Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a motion to close the hearing until you guys have discussed it. And there may be other questions you want answered from the applicant that, that maybe some members of the public raise. Um, so I would hold, uh, it would be my recommendation to hold that open for a bit. Okay. So does it, do any of our members have any comments or questions that given the public comment?
There was one, um, uh, Pauline, you're muted. I have. Okay. Um, you know, I feel like we are rushing and, um, you know, to a decision. We've been presented with schematic drawings. I, you know, I couldn't make a decision on that. I think that, uh, you know, the most people who, who spoke uh, would like to see uh, the church preserved. And I think that it is, you know, I think that it deserves more time to explore, uh, you know, the, some of the possibilities that were mentioned tonight. Um, like you may, go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, it, um, you certainly need to have enough information about um, whether a case has been made about the, um, again, about that um, functional or structural obsolescence and about the numbers and the, and the effort made for um, determining whether uh, um, the building could be reused. So I don't know if you um, feel that there's more information you need so any decision you make, make it in the context of that. And if there's more information, I know someone, a uh, member of the public asked about whether there was any, um, the applicant had information about the costs for demolition and reconstruction of the five or six units, you know, as a, you know, to balance that number with how much it costs for, um, um, yes. preserving the building temporarily. Mm -hmm. um, so, and of course, any other questions you might have about mm -hmm. um, how the applicant has demonstrated meeting or not meeting the criteria under your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Well, that, right, that is a question, um, you know, that, that I would be curious to know about the demolition costs for, uh, and uh, you know, building something new as opposed to preserving what's already there. Can we ask for that information as supplemental information um, in addition to more renderings, more material? description you can ask for whatever information you want the applicant might have it now they might need to come back to you but you can you know i think it would make sense for you to identify the information that you was you are seeking and then the applicant can respond to say oh i've got this right now or i need some more time yeah um matt i would you know for starters um Perhaps you can share uh, your estimated demolition and abatement costs or hazardous material abatement costs um, with the um, the renovation costs. So we would compare the two. We would compare demo um, with the new construction. Yeah, with the new construction. I'm thinking. Actually, I'm thinking demolition with the renovation costs also. So I think those would be the two factors we'd be looking at is, um, you know, they're saying that let's demo it, you know, it'll have this cost to demolish it and debate it versus keeping it up and alive. So keeping it up and alive, renovation costs, and the bit of demolition that has to, or the bit of asbestos abatement and, and hazardous material that has to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, happy to address that. So the, the Delta is really $125 per square foot. Um, mm -hmm. What is the rent? Uh, so, so if you were to take the, the, the cost of bringing the building, the renovation cost to, to uh, weather tightness, plus the uh, environmental abatement, you're adding $125 per square gross square foot to the construction costs. And that's at the top line. So that means if we were going to construct new, we would be somewhere probably within $200 per gross square foot. And 
uh, like I mentioned earlier, the cost to bring the building to code, um, mechanical, electric, plumbing, fire protection, structural, uh, seismic, we would probably be in the $200 range as well. And so uh, we're looking at um, a difference of Eight hundred thousand to a million dollars more expensive to to renovate. Do you have a figure for how much it would cost to demolish the building, or an estimate? Yes, that's uh, that's probably ninety thousand to a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I'd like to ask if you considered. Um, I know that not everybody uh, who commented will like this uh, idea, but I wondered if you considered. Um, putting more of a commercial style building on that corner instead of townhomes or something with retail on the bottom and apartments on the top. We did look at um, considering a mixed use building. The, the issue of COVID was still, it's still front of mind and we weren't comfortable in um, leading with that type of use knowing that there's, there's not a market at this time for, for that type of uh, use. We would also be constrained by the lack of parking. Um, so if we were gonna do a mixed use building where we were trying to create some sort of density, we would be, we're on a, a third of an acre. And so we would be essentially going straight vertical and probably six to seven stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you you increase the the height of your construction, um, construction costs go up commensurately. So um, we realized that we were, you know, every time we pushed or pulled one lever, we were affecting another. And so, you know, any gains that we would have in terms of, you know, maybe diversifying the offering where there could be a mixed use, um, we were constrained by the lack of parking. Um, the fact that we would have to, to increase the height of the building again without parking to be accommodated on site. And that would be another strain on, on, uh, on Phillips and Holland. I'm sure a six or seven story building would not go over at all well in that neighborhood, but a, a three story building <laughs> might, it's similar to what's across the street. Right, and, and the, the issue again is that um you know at that level of density the the rent numbers are and and just to clarify the the four thousand dollars to to break even was something that um we felt was not supported by the market so that's not something that we would we would pursue and um we have looked at um other funding mechanisms in terms of what i'll call affordable with a capital a so there would be you know, low income housing tax credit, both at the state and federal level. And their, their sweet spot is typically um, within the 30 to 50 unit range. And again, um, we would be looking at a six to seven story building without parking. And um, that, that usually has a two to three year award period. So we would be extending um, this process another two to three years without, you know, any uh, guarantee for success. So your model is to rent, right? These are all units that are going to be rented? For sale. They're for sale. Um, so if you were, you know, in that, you know, being a walk, walk to town, if they were very nice units, Conceivably, you could sell them for around five hundred thousand dollars if you did the church. If you went, if you preserved the church, um, would it be realistic to think that you could get five units out of there at uh, five hundred thousand dollars? I don't. I don't. I don't know. Um, I would think without parking, it would be difficult to to command that type of price. Mm -hmm. Well, there is park, isn't there parking there now? There's not.
Oh, across the way, uh, across the street, there's a parking uh, parking or a parking lot. Those are Do separate. you own that too, Matt? I'm sorry, Melissa. Do you own the parking lot across the street? We do. We do. So, uh, Trip, you said 39 percent potential tax credit. Um, is that based on uh, what number would that be based on? The value of the property or value of construction? No, the historic preservation tax credits. Um, well, first of all, you want to have a building that's going to be awarded, and this clearly would. Um, you get 20% from the state and 20% from the federal, but then there's uh, brokers that take a few percent. So you figure about 38% of all the money you spend comes back into your pocket. And so that really helps the equation quite a bit. And I've been practicing for 50 years and I have seen endlessly this existing buildings being looked at as too expensive to fix. Up. And that building has a very solid envelope. Um, it's, uh, you know, maybe the roof started leaking since the last time I was there a few years ago, but the, the cost to, use the envelope as it is, which is what you'd have to do for the tax credits, keep it looking the same on the outside. Um, whatever you put in there, I, I don't believe the numbers that were just presented about how expensive it is. It's not expensive. You have the building, the footings, the foundation, the roof, it's all there. All it needs is an interior renovation. So, and then with 40% of your money coming back, it's a slam dunk. So what do you does anybody know the, the does anybody know how the biggest um, CPA grant that Northampton has given out? Just out of curiosity. I don't know. Just trying to cover CPA, that. No CPA funding is would just be a minor um, cost coverage for historic preservation, um, so it wouldn't be anything like something you'd get from tax credits. So Matt, with that, with 38% uh, going back into your pocket to preserve the building, that, seem, that does seem like an attractive program. Well, that's, I mean, we're, we're kind of um, talking off the cuff here. Um, you know, I I, uh, I do have to take exception to the the characterization that the the building is uh, an envelope is is tight. Um, we 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 rented a 125 foot lift, evaluated the the bell tower. Um, we had our consultant examine essentially every um, part of the building to assess the, the necessary depth of the repointing and. Um, there's, there's bricks that are currently in place uh, by sheer luck. Um, so um, I have to disagree with, with the, uh, the characteriz characterization that the, the building is weather tight. Um, we've, we've assessed uh, the full envelope and um, requires, the entire building needs to be repointed. I assume you explored um, the tax credit idea in your thinking about this. We've evaluated the uh, the low income housing tax credit process and um, weren't able to fit the enough enough units within the end within the, the existing footprint to um, probably attract or garner enough attention to make it um, attractive to the funding agencies. Typically, um, in our experience, it's somewhere between 30 to 50 units, and we would be able to fit. About not, not low income, but historic tax credits, historic preservation tax credits. Uh, we uh, we've not uh, pursued that path. Haven't pursued that. My, my guess is that we are not going to have a consensus here tonight, given what I'm hearing from the other members. Um, is, is something, um, uh, would it make sense to continue the hearing and perhaps 
you might look into the historic tax credit idea. Mm -hmm. Talk to this um, developer in Pittsfield that successfully rehabbed a few churches. Maybe talk to um, Jim Olson. It probably won't go anywhere, but it might be worth a conversation. It would, um, and uh, um, and then you know continue it for a month or two, and then revisit it. We would be willing to, to have those conversations. Pardon me? We would be willing to have those conversations and to evaluate that funding source. Okay, good. Um, my colleagues think and so Carolyn. you typically you typically meet on well, there's been no typical in the last year, so <laughs> I'll take that back. Um, you've had you have been meeting on the first Tuesdays of the month. Um, you obviously can pick any date and time that you all are all available. But um, so you might want to pick, let's see, it's February 22nd. So you probably want at least a month. So either late March or early April. Well, how about the first Tuesday in April? Okay, so that would be, um, yep, that would be April 6th. Um, so um, you could, I don't know if you all have your calendars here, but you could, if that works for you and the applicant, then um, you could say um, you would need to vote, move and vote to continue to um, that date at a specific time. Mm -hmm. So you could do 6.30 again if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask also, uh, Matt, is a like public private um, project something that O'Connell would consider or not? Um, probably like, not at this time. Look too late. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what was your question? I'm sorry, Pauline. Oh, I, I was just curious to know if O'Connell would be interested in exploring that public private relationship that had been mentioned a few times. Yeah. Maybe. Is, I would, I'd like to say um, in terms of continuing the hearing also that um, I'm, it might, I would probably be more inclined to look favorably on a commercial style building on that corner than five townhomes. Um, but uh, so I don't know if, if you, uh, you know, would think a little bit more about that, not a seven story building, but a three story building. But um, uh, but I, I think that issue might be worth a little more exploration. Because the, the whole idea of, of you know, this property going into central business was that we're working, you know, the, the plan for the city is to have more density closer to the city center, have more people living closer to the city center. And so, you know, even though the people in the neighborhood are, you know, um, uh, uh, like living in a more, in a less dense environment, you know, this, I think the, the infill question is something that is, uh, it's been decided that it's a good idea. And so it, it's, it's worth considering that a little more, I think. Anybody have anything else to say? Is there a hand raised? Yes. Well, I, I have that. some historic preservation consultants that I could send your way, Matt, if you want. So then if you had decided on um, the six, you can um, just specify uh, if you want to do 6.30 again, um, you so can we could vote on that motion to, We could entertain a motion to, continuing, to continue the hearing until April 6th if somebody wants to do that. I make, I so move. I think you have to make the motion. Oh, I make a motion 
And we continue this meeting to um, April 6th at 6.30. Do I hear a second? I second. Okay. So I guess we're gonna have a roll call. <laughs> yep. um, yeah. And there are only two out <laughs> there, so. Great. So Melissa. So, yes. So what is the roll call? <laughs> you just have to specifically vote, um, identify which way you're voting on the motion. I, I vote in favor of pushing it off. And Pauline? I, I, uh, I approve that motion. <laughs> and I also vote to continue the hearing till April 6th. Okay. So um, that ends that part of the discussion. <laughs> um, there are a couple of other quick items um, I just wanted to go over with the committee. Oh, and just to make sure everyone knows, actually before people sign off, this is an open public hearing. Committee members are not allowed to talk to anybody outside of the public hearing about this project. Um, that goes for reporters, um, residents, neighbors, friends, um, any conversation about this project has to be conducted within the context of the public hearing. And can Bob be, can, can Bob uh, look at what we've done and so that he could participate in the, on April 6th? Yes, he can review the record and then um, be an active participant then. So I will connect with him about that. So the only other thing I saw on the agenda was um, minutes from the August meeting. Right, and so, yeah, and um, just one other item in addition to that, and you all are just accepting them as part of the record. So if you weren't there now, I don't have them in front of me, so I don't remember. <laughs> um, um, so you can take that vote. And then I just wanted to go over the, again, sort of that whole concept of public meeting and, and conversations about projects. So are we gonna to vote to accept the minutes now? Yeah, you need to do that, yeah. So, and so the date was August 6th? Yes, I believe that's correct. Oh, this, it actually, um, I have it down on the 5th, but that could be wrong. Oh, okay. So uh, I actually don't remember if I was there. The date for the next meeting? Did you? No, the, the minutes. Uh, let me just pull it up. Thanks. Oops. August 5th. Yep, you're right. Yep. Jeez. So everyone was there at that meeting, actually. Um, do we need to have a roll call for this? Uh, yeah, motion. I don't, did somebody move already? We need a motion and then uh, a, a second and then a vote. Okay. So, so would somebody like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the August meeting? I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of August 5th. I'll second do it. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. Okay, <laughs> Melissa, how do you vote? I, uh, I approve the motion. <laughs> I approve the motion. As do I. Okay, great. Um, so then the only other reminder, and it's, um, I know that this was um, precipitated by a question from Elan about, um, her, she had a contact from the Gazette, um, asked her about this project last week, and she told the um, staff writer that she could not talk about the project because it was a pending public hearing. And the um, writer insisted that she could because she often talks to city council and school committee members before meetings. And so, um, Alan just sort of pushed back and said, no, I can't talk to you, which of course is the right answer. Um, 
And so uh, she and I just talked and thought, okay, this probably um, makes sense to just remind everybody that even if you haven't opened the public hearing, you can't talk about a project you know that is coming in front of the committee. Um, and uh, because it's considered ex parte contact and a violation of open meeting law, and it's very different from a legislative discussion that would happen at city council or school committee. So that's the difference. Um, I also actually spoke to the reporter and clarified that for her. So now she understands the, the difference. Um, so I'll have to get back with, you know, just remind the other folks who aren't here tonight of that as well. So that's the only other item that I just wanted to touch base with you on um, before you vote to adjourn. Yeah, I appreciate the reminder. Definitely. Yep. Likewise. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have figured that out. So do I hear a motion to adjourn? I so I make the motion that we adjourn this meeting. I second it. I, second? Meet it. <laughs> <laughs> I vote I approve the motion. <laughs> I approve the motion too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Good at this. Great.